The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark in the 10th chapter. Listen now for God's word to you. Some of the Pharisees came to test Jesus, and they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus answered them, saying, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And then in the house, the disciples asked Jesus again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And people were bringing little children to him in order that they might touch, that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to the children and the people bringing the children. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to his disciples, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these the kingdom of heaven belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took the children up in his arms and he laid hands on them and blessed them. May the Lord bless unto us the readings of Scripture to God be glory, dominion, and might, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, today is World Communion Sunday. Throughout the western parts of the world, people in Christian churches, regardless of denominations, are celebrating the Lord's gift to us through the sign and the seals of the sacrament of Holy Communion. And I find it ironic that on this day that we celebrate Christian unity, differences but Christian unity together, I find it ironic that the common lectionary used in mainline churches puts before us one of the most divisive situations in Christian church, in Christian life. The controversy in Christianity regarding divorce and remarriage. I find it just strange. Sometimes I want to call the people up who put forth this lectionary and say, what in the world are you doing? The topic has been controversial since the beginning. Biblically speaking, in the old days, 
the controversy was not as great in the early parts of the Old Testament because they practiced, like many people at that time, polygamy. If you wanted a new wife, you just went out and got one. Abraham and Sarah. Sarah can't have a baby, so Sarah gives Hagar, the Egyptian maid, to Abraham, and they have Ishmael. Only later is Isaac born to Abraham and Sarah. And Jacob, he goes and tries to get one wife and comes out having two. Wonderful story, almost hilarious how that happens. And not only does he have two, he now has two concubines. And by the time you get to the kings in the Old Testament, well, the kings can't even count how many wives and concubines that they have. By Jesus' day, monogamy was the rule. But it was still a hot topic, this idea of divorce and remarriage. Now, contemporaries of Jesus, two main rabbis, they represent two schools of thought, and most scholars believe those two schools of thought are represented by the Pharisees asking the question of Jesus. The first school of thought was Shammai school, the Shammai rabbis. And they would be, in our terminology today, strict constructionist of the law. Strict construction. The other would have been Hillel, the rabbi Hillel. And he was considered to be a loose constructionist of the law. In the Shammai school, there were only two occasions that you could divorce your spouse. One was adultery, unfaithfulness, infidelity, however you want to call it. And the second was infertility. And that's the strict construction. But in Hillel Rabbi School, the loose constructionist, and this is the truth, you can divorce your spouse for burning the bread, burning your meals, being seen in public with another man, or being attracted to another man. That was grounds for divorce. Both of these schools are represented and they come and ask Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And you can just see the Shemel, Shemai school is going, oh, you better be strict in this. And the other ones, you better be loose in this. The intent of the heart of the Pharisees, though, is to entrap Jesus. They wanted to humiliate Jesus by his answers to this very, very complex question. They wanted to stop his influence over the people that were beginning to be large crowds following Jesus. And it's interesting. Jesus says, what does Moses say? Ah, Moses says, you can do it. You can divorce your wife. And Jesus says, only because of the hardness of your heart. Now we're going to touch on that in a minute. And then Jesus quotes Genesis. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they will be one flesh. And what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus is stating the intent of God 
in marriage from the earliest moments that we find in Scripture. And I believe he has stated it very clearly. Now, there's something you need to know. Marriage and difficult divorce was a protection of women's rights. This is a patriarchal society. And the choices available to women if they were divorced by the man issuing divorce, they were considered to be chattel, you see, property. And so were the daughters, property. The only option if they were issued a, a certificate of divorce was they had to go back to their mother or father. And the mother or father is not alive. They had to go and live with the brother. In any case, they returned home in shame. And people would say, damaged goods. Or, they had the choice to live with the widows and the orphans and be destitute for the rest of their days. Or, they could become prostitutes and earn their living from the streets. Any way you define it, it was not a good situation. And Jesus says the original intent of marriage. But it, I find it interesting. Jesus draws this verse out of the second chapter of Genesis. Now, it is not until the third chapter of Genesis that we realize the fall of human beings. That classical term, the fall, first sin, eating of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, however you want to unpack that. The point being is how in the world are people to live together when paradise is lost? in the terms of John Milton. How do we live together in a lost paradise? Thus we can talk about the intent of God and as life comes at us as we live today, the circumstantial will of God in our lives. We all, you and I, have a fallen nature. That is, seems to be our lot in life. And certainly, the brokenness in, even in families is not the intent of God. But what these verses do and what Jesus is doing is asking us to measure the intent of your heart when you approach this very hot topic. One flesh, intentional will of God. But for us, we know we live life in the trenches, don't we? We live life in the midst of tough, tough circumstances. Now, you might be thinking, well, before you get married, it certainly would be great to know about your spouse before you even get there to the solemnization of your wedding vows. Now, having done many weddings, that is seldom going to happen. It's only after life together that we know. Now in 
40 plus years of ministry, I have only refused to pre uh, preside over a wedding three times. And I was in Dallas at the time, and the young couple comes, and I could tell there were situations. I did a little question asking, and already some physical abuse was beginning to take place. Now, my first parish in Dallas, two-thirds of the membership were related either by blood or marriage. The young woman sitting before me was one of that family. I decided I could not do in good conscience that wedding. And the pushback was not pleasant, as you can imagine. Approximately six months later, the couple did not get married. He is beating in the windows of her car with a baseball bat going after her. A year later, they call me and thank me for heading that off. I had no thanks. I was trying to follow what the scriptures and the intent of what the scripture and Jesus is saying. Another time was someone said, well, if we don't like it, we can just get out of it. I said, stop the train. We're not going down that road. And the final one was, I'd known this young girl. She was not a church member here. I had been a part of her life in different sporting activities, and she came to me and wanted to get married, and the two of them come into my office, and one is sitting on one end of the couch, and one is sitting on the other. And never the twain was going to meet. And they were delusional of thinking that getting married was going to solve the separation. They were already divorced. The good news is she found somebody else. Wonderful guy. And I did the wedding. Well, two years away. Now... You know, I, I realize I'm not a very practical preacher. I talk in concepts and let you try to figure it out. But this morning, I, I do feel that I have to be, dot some I's and cross some T's here. These are my practical reflections about divorce and remarriage based on what I believe the scriptures teach. And I will start first, no grounds for divorce. And this is pretty rare, guys. You don't need to take this down. One. Trade in on a new model. You want to trade your spouse in on a new model. Now, in Greek is tricky here. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another. The word chi in Greek is and normally. But it also means two. Either way, you can't separate that conjunction. It seems from the text, whoever divorces his wife in order to marry another. The same, the converse is true. Whoever divorces her husband. In order to marry another. You see, they go together. This is the trading in on a newer model of spouse. And Jesus, not me, calls that adultery. The second, trade in on a better model. You might be drive, driving a Corolla. You want to trade in on a Lexus. 
This is what I call the gold digger approach. You know what a gold digger is. Where a spouse trades in the other one, issues a divorce in order to marry someone who is more financially secure, socially prominent, it happens. And that applies, gold diggers can be men and women. It may be legal, but Jesus calls it adultery. Three, health issues. One spouse gets terminally ill or has a bad illness. And the other says, I just cannot deal with this. No divorce. It's not the will of God. For better or for worse, richer or poor, in sickness and in health. I have asked that hundreds of times. How do you respond? That's the covenant. All of these three are outside, I believe, from the text, the whole text, the will of God. The second part, what is permissible in divorce? For the life of me, and I've seen this happen, physical violence in a family, where the spouse is afraid of physical abuse, where the children are frightened of one of the spouses, they live in the horror of not knowing who will come home <coughs> and come in that door. And that living like that will destroy a person's soul. Some sadly say, I don't believe in divorce. And we'll put up with it to the detriment of the entire psychological, physical detriment of that family and those children. In that case, I think Christ would tell us, remove yourself from that threat. That also goes, number two, for emotional abuse. It's not physical, but it's just as detrimental. I'm not talking about, I see a lot of married folks in here. Have you ever had an argument with your spouse? If you haven't, you're lying. You've got two people, broken individuals. There are going to be some conflicts. I'm not talking about that this morning. This is beyond just disagreements. This is seeking to control, absolutely consume the other one. It's a kind of emotional manipulation in which one is sacrificing his or her life for the other. Three, slavery to vices. Whether that's substance abuse, gambling, those things that enter into our life from the outside of us can destroy the security of a family. It will destroy them emotionally. It will destroy them financially. Now, I know today we categorically put alcoholism, drug addiction, and a lot of other addiction into sickness. But there's one thing, an illustration I might use. When, back when, in my early teens, I wanted to be a lifeguard. And you have to go to lifeguard school. And um, one thing you learn early in lifeguard school, when you go to save somebody, you don't let them drown you. 
And sometimes, if they will not cooperate, you must, if you are to save them, make them numb with a slap or a punch in order to save them. And yes, sometimes the warning is the slap in the face. But there are some who do not want to be rescued. And Jesus asked a man once by the pool of Siloam, do you want to be healed? You've been out here like forever. Do you want to be healed? Perfect question. If they don't, I think divorce falls in the circumstantial will of God. It's better for that than to drown the entire rest of the family. Or the spouse gets up and leaves. You're abandoned. That's grounds. And finally, and very importantly, I think, a spouse does not want you to practice your religion. Forbids you to worship God. That's a circumstantial will of God. Not the intent, but it is our ways to try to make some sense out of living life in a fallen world. I've heard people say that divorce, well, children are flexible. No, divorce hurts, no matter how it comes. It hurts everyone involved, the family children, extended family, it's always difficult. And sometimes people have to choose from the lesser of the evils, and may God love them when they have to make that hard choice. But it's interesting, I read that part about children Jesus is talking about the intent of one's heart for your hardness of heart. And what he's talking about, for your waywardness of heart, these rules emerge. It's not God's original intent. And he talks about the children. For such, to such, belong the ch belongs the kingdom of God. And what are children like? What's the intent of a child's heart? To show love. To receive love. To express joy. And have that joy expressed to them. And I will say this as a caveat. If you've gone through a divorce... And perhaps it's not for a reason that I have mentioned. God is a loving God. And God forgives. And for those that are in the circumstantial will of God, forget. Leave it. Don't carry a burden. You did what you thought was the best thing after measuring the very intent of your heart. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>